you're involved daily in praying for someone at this moment, if you are having petitions put to God that you haven't received an answer yet, what a song that puts together some truth that you need. Because you're putting the kingdom of God first as you ask and seek and knock in prayer. By being assembling with the saints who are all members of citizens of the same kingdom, but we're here to worship God that we're praying to. We're here to edify one another through our singing of praise to God and to one another. We're putting God first. I don't know how we could be putting him first any, any better than being here and encouraging so many people at one time. We could be in a personal work program right now and had to go talk to somebody about the gospel today. They're going to die and they're in the hospital. And you'll be back tonight. But the, the point is, is that of all of doing what we can do in such a short time, you are putting God's rule right now in place. So you keep asking and seeking God and wanting answers from your prayer and seeking his help. And at this moment, we are centered around the word of God. We realize we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And therefore, we come to the point where we're going to examine God's word and understand how we should be living. And as Nathan, as Mason rather read for us this morning, Part of the reading was verse 31 of 1 Corinthians 10. We don't live by bread alone, but we're going to be eating. Whether therefore you eat or you drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Where is this sermon going? And you think, well, I, I don't know, but I know one thing when I'm seeing this, I'm talking about food. And I'm talking about something I eat and I'm something I drink and there's a fork there. And I think that preacher may be getting on gluttony today. I don't know. Oh, I hope he doesn't go there. It's about eating. <laughs> I've been trying for a month to get on a more healthier diet and, and it, uh, He's going to be stepping on my toes. Why would you want to think I'm going to preach on gluttony? You're talking about food. And whatever you do to the glory of God. So you're not going to preach on that today. That's not going to be your, your focus. Well, I'll tell you what it might mean. We've got some people here that might not be saying prayers over their food. And they don't thank God for their food as they should. And... Preacher may be, be involved in teaching us that we need to say grace every time we eat. And whatever you do in, in eating and drinking, you're doing the glory of God. I think that would be praising him as one who is one to be exalted and thank him for our food. And you could go all sorts of different directions. But before you go off there and tune me out, I want you to tune in to think, why in the world would he start with eating? Gluttony and saying prayers for over our food? Ah, you could, we could go there, but why does he do that here? Why does he start with eating and then going to drinking and then going to everything else we do? Do all to the glory of God. It has a context. And in these verses, you see how much is involved in eating. In the context. First of all, there's some food being sold in the marketplaces. In the shambles, the American Standard says. You eat it. You go to H-E-B, get the food. Go to Kroger, you get the food. You go, you go to the place where they butcher your deer, you just eat the food. And don't worry about your conscience. But you eat. So there's eating. But then verse 27, here comes somebody that wants you to come over for lunch. We're going to eat again in this chapter. Someone who's not even a Christian. 
invites you to a feast. Eat. Eat. Asking no questions for conscience sake. That's more than, is that involved in gluttony? No, we're, we're looking at something in a, in a context that's different than that. We've gone from the marketplace, we're gone to lunch with somebody who's not a Christian, and now we're seeing a problem where you don't eat now. You don't eat now. When they say this has been sacrificed to idols, got something to do with eating, doesn't it? You don't eat this time. And again, we're talking about the conscience. And then before we finish the context, there's the question of somebody, you've been told me to eat and don't ask questions. And all of a sudden, how come I am evil? Because I partake, that's eating. I partake with thanksgiving. And just show you that I don't need a sermon on praying over my food. This person says, I've given thanks. And I'm still condemned. I'm still spoken evil of. How can that be? It's all about eating. Don't see a word about drinking. That doesn't mean I can drink all sorts of things. But what does he do it? I'm taking it from the immediate context of specificity that is under consideration in this sermon. And we're expanding it because there's never anything that we do that we shouldn't do to the glory of God. So what we expanded to from eating, which is emphasized and emphasized, he starts there. He could have started with drinking and eating. But eating and then expands it to something that's related to that, drinking, and then expands it further to the very general where it's inclusive of everything we do. Do what? Do unto the glory of God. I want us to see this morning how we can do that from this context and realize that here we are maybe glorifying God or doing it to the glory of God because this is how he wants us to live and may be condemning us if we don't do that. And it's not gluttony. And in this context, it's not, you didn't say your grace, over, you didn't say your prayers before you ate. It's none of those. So what is it? What is it? Well, we're placed in a time where people were offering meats to sacrifice to idols. We're dealing with a pagan, pagan world. And we've got somebody inviting us to lunch that's a pagan. And we're going to be doing things today to the glory of God. I'm going to look at three areas. All starts with a C. We're giving glory to God, first of all, as our creator. That's the context. I don't know that. Because he gives an explanation. When you don't ask questions for conscience sake and you're eating... You realize something is there for you. You don't have to have any question about it. Normally, you wouldn't have a problem because he gives you the reason. For the earth is the Lord's creator. And everything on it that's full of things I can eat, I can eat. So you don't have to ask questions. Your conscience can be clear. Because why? God, I give you the glory as my creator. And I'm eating today. We already know he has thanksgiving in his heart. When he's told to eat. But he is now realizing you're the one that provides everything. And therefore everything as I am mean, a New Testament Christian. Is open. That's my knowledge. Therefore, my conscience is not going to be affected. And I can eat anything that's put before me. This pastor said, well, you can't have fried food. 
And we're not talking about going to lunch and eating with a fork and all that. But it's interesting that God doesn't specify whether it's fried or grilled, and therefore you're a Christian or you're not. But food. And we'll see it expanded a little bit further in a moment. But that's the first reason why eat and don't ask questions for conscience sake. Your conscience should be clear because you are serving the creator of the universe in Christ. You're serving him as a Christian. And therefore, I'm going to do everything to the glory of God. So go. And uh, meat sold at HEB and the shambles and all that sort of thing. You'd eat because it all came from God's creation and the fullness of the earth. They keep, they keep having cattle and they keep having chickens and that they can, I just can't eat the fullness thereof. Isn't it interesting how he feeds the world? When the world says we're getting too many people and we're going to starve to death, we hadn't done it yet. It's interesting. Man learns more scientific things, how to produce more out of a particular land they have. And we just still say, well, I, I don't think we have, we have too many people. Oh, the fullness there of God provides. He continues to do that. We glorify him for that. Secondly, the world is blessed by God. He can be a believer or an unbeliever. It doesn't make any difference. And what, has been, is, what is meat that is sold in the shambles? That indeed, that was, that's God's creation. And the reason I, I, well, how do I glorify God? Is that I recognize as I involve partaking and giving thanks, is that he blesses the world. Christians, non-Christians. How does he do that? He's speaking to a pagan world in Acts 14, Paul is. And he says that indeed God has indeed brought forth the rain. What does that produce? It produced fruitful seasons. What does that do? I go pick up the produce and I fill my heart with food. Uh-oh, it went down the wrong place, didn't it? I spoke to go to my stomach. His, the Bible says it fills your heart with food. What's that? He puts, conflates the two together. You eat that food, say, so, mmm, it's good. And you rejoice. And you're rejoicing because God has provided that. And indeed, well, I can take my food with gladness, glorying in God as my creator. And in Christ, there's no dietary restrictions. And what we begin to realize is that I glorify him as my creator. And so what does the Christian do? In verse 30, in a context of asking a question of why, which we'll answer in a few moments. He said, how come I'm going to be spoken evil of if I partake, that's eating, with thanksgiving? And for those of you who want a sermon that my mate or my husband, my wife needs to say prayer over grace, then you've got one right here. Here's the point. He just, and she didn't have just a heart of thanksgiving. They gave thanks. There's your prayer. He knows I'm thankful. Do you tell him so? Do you tell people thank you? Well, they know I'm thankful. Isn't it interesting? He takes the picture. I'm giving thanks. I'm partaking with thanksgiving. And I'm giving thanks. God, what more do you want? And now I'm, how can I ever be considered evil? But that's the context. That's our focus. We want to answer that before the sermon's done. So I can, I can do that with, with, a, with a clean conscience. And as we see in verse 25, do so with a clean conscience. 1 Timothy 1, I think, nails it down for us as New Testament Christians. Where the Apostle Paul says all creation is, is good. <laughs> all creatures are good. And it's in the context of food. For every creature of God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it be received with thanksgiving. Well, I'm going to thank God for it. I got that. We got that nailed. For it is sanctified through the word of God and prayer. You're just full of thanksgiving and you give thanksgiving in prayer for the food that you're 
freely allowed to eat by a creator who brings forth the fullness of the earth and continues to do that by his laws of nature. So when we look at this passage, well, how do you glorify God over here? Eating and drinking. Well, in eating, here it's being set forth, is that he is our creator and we give him thanks. And I can eat with a clear conscience. Whatever, I guess, will taste good to you that you want to eat today. But secondly, I'm going to give God glory, and we are because we honor the conscience. That just, it continues. That's the whole point, uh, one of the main points that we're seeing in this context. How do we maintain a clear conscience and clean conscience, and why would we so be worried with conscience? That's part of glorifying God. The more I'm around household pets, you know, if I go see them or, or that I'm around them, I see them, I realize they don't have a conscience. I don't think they have one. They don't mind doing what I think is bad. And, of course, we train them and they learn to do things. But the idea of this is right or this is wrong, that's what we have in us. And I just call it an inward courtroom. Have you ever been to a, a courtroom and you sit and watch the trial? And there's evidence being presented, and then there's a decision being made either by the judge or by the, by the jury. You have built in you an inward courtroom where decisions are being made based upon knowledge that you have, which is the evidence. And every one of us is daily exercising what comes out of that courtroom, and it's called the conscience. Look what Paul says in Romans 2 and verse 15 when he describes, well, the, the, the Gentiles didn't have a law of Moses like the Jews had. So what, what about them and their relationship with God? And the apostle Paul makes it clear in that they, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts. There's the knowledge that they're getting. It shows that these same principles that were codified in the law of Moses. They have written in their heart through practice. You know, it's still wrong to kill, wrong to do these things. They have that, though they didn't have that written law to them. They have it in their heart through teaching and, and one's generation after another. But what's happening? Their conscience bearing witness therewith with their knowledge of truth and their thoughts one with another, accusing or else excusing. Not guilty. Accusing, guilty. Excusing, not guilty. There's your courtroom scene. <laughs> and there's something within you that has knowledge within yourself. You say, that's right. That's wrong. You're right. You're innocent. Or you're guilty. And we base it upon knowledge that we have. Well, why would they ever be innocent? Maybe they're too young. You have all those factors coming together. And that is a conscience. Have you ever thought about God? Thank you for that. Or are we always violating our conscience and it hurts us and we don't like it? It is a built-in reference of, of moral. We were made in the image of God. We're spiritual creatures. And he's given us a moral compass. Now, let your conscience be your guide. How'd that work for Paul? All good conscience and killed Christians. That's wrong. He learned that. You're only going to judge in your courtroom according to what you know to be the truth. It may be error. I heard a man that has a weekly week, Saturday and Sunday, and he's uh, on, on guard line, and he's, he knows a lot about plants and flowers and so forth. And he speaks about the idea of how wonderful it is to be a gardener. And he says, I may be prejudiced, but that doesn't make me wrong. And that's true. <laughs> you may be prejudiced. I think that's the best way to go. That doesn't mean you're wrong. But we have a standard that determines we know what is right and wrong because we're glorifying God. 
He's the one that made us in his image. He created the food for us to eat. But in that eating, we also have a conscience. And at this point of the lesson, we're learning that indeed that conscience is there and he could eat anything that was God had created. These are meats with a clear conscience. Don't ask anything for conscience sake. Not trying, I, 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 got, a, I got a conscience. I got a, no, you, you don't have to worry about it. Don't have to worry about the conscience because normally we would be. But there's an eating here that you don't even have to think twice about it. But what we're seeing here is a conscience that we're now in the glory of God. God would have us, you'd consider your own conscience. Yes. But here we're expanding it to the conscience of others. And we have a little standard to go by in Romans, the 14th chapter and verse 23, when he's speaking here of Christians who were from a Jewish, not a pagan background, a Jewish background. And they had dietary restrictions. The law of God says you can eat pork. But Christians are not under that law, but he's writing to people. They're coming out of the background of that law. They're now Christians and here are a bunch of Gentiles. So I don't eat anything I won't do. And it's interesting, God's on their side. Because he's made all meats clean. And Paul knows that and preaches it. He's not hiding it. Because why? This is the truth. Bring your conscience in your courtroom into the new knowledge that you have. But you, what happens when I, I just can't see that yet? You care about the other person's conscience. They can't get there yet. That's part of glorifying God and eating are not eating. So we come to verse 28, where this is the place where we eat, 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 and all of a sudden, verse 28, nope, you better think again. And notice how it expands to another. Beginning with verse 28, he says, But if any man say unto you, Thus have been offered in sacrifice, eat not. Change of direction. All to the glory of God, but change direction. Eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake. I told, thought, I thought I could eat anything, and I don't even have to ask questions for conscience. That's true. And you know what? That's still in place. You know good and well that you can't eat Meat sacrificed to idols. So therefore, you're not going to eat on that direction because of your conscience. But we're now expanding it. What about the conscience of a pagan? Who has asked you to come to a feast? Verse 27 says, those are unbelievers that believeth not. They invite you to dinner. They invite you to a feast with a lot of friends. And you decide to go. And whatever they put there, you eat. Asking no question. Why, why could you eat that? And he's a pagan. Because all meats are clean. But now he says they've been sacrificed to idols. And that means you're not going to eat of it. Because you're conscious. But really he said, everything to the glory of God is that I expand my look at myself and my courtroom. And said, he's got one going over there too. And he lacks the knowledge. And for me to eat after I hear that, I'm not going to be glorifying God. And he just emphasizes, yours is intact and you know good and well, you're not to ever eat that anyway. But now the, the whole atmosphere has changed. And so what do you do? You pivot. Everything to the glory of God. It's not about me. It's about him for his sake that showed it conscience. I say not that own, but verse 29, but the others, but the others, as we look at the first part of that verse. So now we're be seeing what's taking place here and it's all around eating is connected with the conscience. Mine's clear until this happens. And now I'm considering not just my own, 
I'm not going to eat, but I'm considering the other person's conscience. Well, they're pagans. They don't know. I want them to know better. I want them to know better. And I'm not going to violate that with hypocrisy today. When normally I wouldn't be eating, but, you know, they're the, they're the host of hostess. We don't want to interfere. I just eat today. No, you won't. Not if you're going to glorify God. And you don't have to make a scene of it. You just realize, I can't eat, and I'm not going to do that here. wonder if I do convert him. When I do bring her to Christ, and they see my duplicity, that's not good. So you abstain from eating on that occasion. Then the third point is that I'm glorifying God by considering others. Let's look a little deeper in that. Verse 23, let's look at what happens, see if these things have not already unfolded before our eyes as explanation of this verse. All things are lawful. Yeah. The fullness of the earth belongs, God's done, belongs to me. Everything's lawful. I can eat all foods. That's why, yeah, I got that. But not all things are expedient. No, I've got a little change in the atmosphere here. It's not going to be profitable to me and to that person. Not all things are expedient, though they're lawful. What was sold in the shambles and brought to the feast, at one time, I had no problem with it. But what happened is that this was just offered at the sac sacrifice unto an idol, and now we're eating it while it's warm. How oh, I could be eating. Would you join us? And we realize, no, not all things are expedient. All things are lawful. But not all things edify. We're not building up someone's knowledge so their conscience can kick in the right way. We're tearing it down if we don't follow the directions of God. And by making that scriptural pivot, yes, things are lawful. Yes, they're lawful, but they don't edify another sometime when I do eat them and they're, they're, it's not expedient I don't have to eat that and so we don't so I'm forgoing my liberty to eat all meats unless it's in a context of pagan idolatry but how do you know if they didn't do that and they just didn't tell you I can eat all meats. They didn't make it special because it was sacrificed to an idol, but that meaning is not connected with that here. And all meats are open and lawful. But it wasn't involved in that idolatrous practice. So that's the context that we're looking at here. And what we find in verse 24, we're not seeking our own. That's what the next verse is. So we've got things lawful, but not everything's going to be edifying. And we're last the conscience of another. And then he says, let no man seek his own, but his neighbor's good, their benefit. In this context, their spiritual well-being. That's your focus. It's not, but it's my neighbor. They invited me over. Here's my situation. Their, they, they, their conscience is saying it's okay. Their knowledge is faulty. Therefore, I'm not going to contribute to that, that, that I'm going to edify. I want to build them up. Their knowledge needs to be there. Their conscience is always going to kick into what they know to be truth. We've got to get the truth in them. And pagan idolatry is wrong. And you're being faithful to your conscience, but you're considering others. 23 and 24 are just introductions to what we learn specifically. All meats are clean, lawful. But not all things are expedient. That's not maybe the best way to profit things under the glory of God. Yeah, they're lawful. I get back to that. I, I can eat all things. My, my conscience can, is clean. Yeah, yeah, but not all things edify. They don't build up in the faith. I'm to seek my neighbor's good, not just think about myself and my own conscience. They got a courtroom battle too. And it's all important to God. So we have two questions. Put yourself here. Meats are all clean. 
I can have them. And here they are. I'm at people's homes, and I'm not going to eat the food. I, it's going to put me in an awkward place. I just, I, God, you know, I, I believe you're the only God. They just give me a pass. No, you're not going to do that. Because that's not glorifying God. He told you how to deal with that. And he, and he, he recognizes your, your questions. Two questions. Why questions? Look at 29b with me. The second part, why, is, I, I would say not the own but others, for why is my liberty judged by another's conscience? That's the question. I've got the liberty to eat all meats. And now I'm going to be judged by another's conscience? Tell me why. Tell me why. And I got another thing. I got another problem here. Here's my second why. If I partake with thankfulness, and I know the preacher today wasn't going to be talking about saying grace, but he sure talked about it a lot. For I, why am I evil spoken of for that I, I do so? I partake, I give thanks. Yeah, we, I'm not just feeling it, I'm giving it. I'm praying. Thank you, God. If I partake with thankfulness, even giving that, how come I'm evil spoken of? God. If I don't follow your directions, well, you're here to glorify God. Didn't say it's easy, didn't say it's convenient. I'm looking for what, what will be the best to edify and build up, not compromise and tear down. And the only answer I can give to that, the only answer to, every, to both of those questions, why is my liberty judged? I'm giving thanks. How I'm, why am I condemned? The answer is the glory of God. At that moment, it's not about you. It's about that unbeliever. And it will work in every situation you're in because everybody's got a courtroom battle going in their own head. And so he says in verse 32, you don't, all things are not edifying. Give no occasion of stumbling. That doesn't sound like I'm being built up. I'm saying I'm falling down. Give no occasion of stumbling by your inappropriate actions regarding this meat, either to Jews that had dietary restrictions and now it's over, to Greeks, because Romans 14 said, I'm not going to allow them to stumble because I'm not going to eat meats if it causes them to stumble. Same principle, cared about the other. Maybe a Jew, maybe a pagan Greek. Or it may be a member of the church, the church of God. I don't care if they're believers in Christ and they're ignorant of what is true. Or whether they're pagans having no problem with idolatry. Or whether they're Jews who only serve the one true God. And they're acting on the basis of not according to the New Testament law. I'm here to give the glory to God. I'm here to glorify God. And therefore, I will not eat because I care about the conscience of another. And that's the text. And what it does, it gives the details of things lawful, but not all things are expedient. It gives things a context of lawful, but they're not all things edify. We don't want anybody to stumble. So your two questions of whether it's legitimate, that you're doing what's right. You have the liberty to do that. Sometimes you've got to forego your liberties. Why do I have to do that? Because you want to give glory to God. That's why. And it's not abstaining from gluttony and getting the prayers right before eating. Those things are in the Bible. I mean, those, we, we see part of that. He does give praise and give thanks. But it's glorifying God by the actions you have and you're turning from serving self and your liberties, giving up your liberties for the edification of, a, of another. Because you know why? Because in verse 32 and 33, you don't want to give a stumbling block to anybody. Even a child of God could stumble and, and fall away. But he says, not my own prophet, but the prophet of the many, that they may be saved. They who? Jews? They who? Pagan, worldly Greeks? 
and Gentiles, they who, the people or members of the church that have not gotten this thing about eating correct, some are judgmental, some may say, we'll just go in the pagan place and they invite us over and we want to be good friends. We may want to save their soul one day. We all sure we're saving souls, but we don't want them to get a hold of that which is not true and then build their courtroom around that piece of evidence and say, that's right. And no, we're going to make it right. And we care about where they are. So what we see in our lesson is the fact that I, in all things that I do, in this context, it was eating meats and sometimes being told that it came out of an idolatrous situation. We do all to the glory of God. So what are we doing? Well, first of all, we're looking up, giving glory to God because he's our creator. He gave us this meat in the first place. I'm glorifying, I'm, 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 I'm giving glory and honor to God for being our creator. Secondly, I'm giving glory to God by inwardly examining the conscience, caring about the conscience. That part of us that nobody sees, but we know we exercise that courtroom battle all the time. And when we don't get it right, when we don't do what we know is right, our conscience hurts us. We should be sensitive to that battle. So I'm going upward. I'm looking inward, not just to my own conscience, but my fellow people in my community, my friends, fellow Christians. And that means I'm going to be looking outward. To Jew, Gentile, fellow Christians, to consider, there's the third C, consider the well-being of their soul, trying to save them who are not saved, trying to keep saved those who are going a different direction because the, the truth is not in them. And they need to know what that truth is. So we're going, this, it's a broad chain of the glory of God, but looking upward into the depths that I can't see, but know that's there and it works. And I, here's what I know to be true. Here's my conscience always kicking in. I want, to, I want to be sensitive to conscience, but it's not going to be my guide. The word of God is. And then I'm looking outward. Upward, inward, outward. And could you think of what a massive thing and, and giving glory to God. And how is one doing that? By what you eat. You ever thought about that? What I eat and and my knowledge connected with that, as he's talking to these first century Christians, glory of God was centered around that. You're going to glorify God in that? And what I want us to understand is that the little details you do in your life, you want to make sure that they're going to be edifying to other people. And you're going to realize that you have a, a wonderful blessing to be an influence as a child of God. There were slaves in the first century. They could adorn the doctrine of God. How do you beautify the doctrine of God if you're a slave? Be obedient to your master. Well, he ain't good to me. Be obedient to your master. And you'll find the New Testament teaches those two things. Because you're doing it unto the Lord. And you're giving him the glory for saving you. And what you want to do, I want to profit others so that I might save their souls. That's living in the glory of God. And I hope we will take that to heart. And that we'll be those types of Christians. What would you have been like if you were asked to go to a pagan feast? And you might be a warning thing, especially when they tell you this has been, this has already been sacrificed to whatever. And you would, you would put that into practice. That's why it was such an important thing there. But creator, conscience, and considering others is just up, it's modern today. It is something we've got to keep in mind as we interact with the people around us with the goal of trying to save their souls. If you're not a Christian yet, you're not a child of God. You're not a, a disciple of the Lord. You're not following Jesus Christ. We encourage you to think seriously about that. But if you realize that he's the son of God and you have not obeyed the gospel, 
by hearing the gospel preached and putting your faith in Christ, by saying, I'm going to repent of my sins. I now know the truth, and therefore, I'm going to put it into practice. Be willing to confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Son of God. And allow us to baptize you. The water is ready. Baptize you into Christ, and you start living as a Christian, realizing this is going to be my first memory first. Whether I eat or whether I drink, I'm going to give it, I'm going to do so unto the glory of God. Everything I do from this point onward, I will do so unto the glory of God. And you've already had a head start of how you're going to do that as a Christian. So why don't you start living that life? You'll never regret that. If we can help you, come as we stand and sing.